sexy. Oh, no. Sexier. Eric, look anger. Yes, that's good. Great. Got it. That's the one. Yeah. 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 It's like very odd. It's a new thing. Um, so, what is your name first? first I'm Mitch Goldberg. Mitch Goldberg? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, we'd like to know at the WA, basically, um, what was the inspiration for some of these pieces and how long have you been working in this medium? Um, I've been working in etching since I think about maybe 2003, 2004. Um, I'm very inspired by uh, male physique photographs in the 1950s and 60s. I use them as inspiration. I also I do ab abstract work as well as figurative work. Mm -hmm. So th these are made with more than one etching plate. So I have, I have the abstract layer you can see which is superimposed mm. over the figurative layer. Um, so I see you're using a lot of mixtures of color and also a, a lot of um, kind of abstract line work with your figures. What comes first for you? The, the line work? Or the figure. Or the figure? The figure, the content. The content. Um, content is always number one with me. Mm, okay. And then I figure out the composition that makes I think makes it work right. Mm -hmm. And then I add the extra layers. I, li I like the way the transparent layers add more d dimension and interest to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also done a lot of work, uh, totally abstract work in glass. So I'm used to working with layers of transparent color. Okay, so oh, this is almost kind of um, the, the glass work that you're doing coming together with the figure. It work. does. That's great. Wow. It does. That's, really That's exactly what I'm doing. Wow, wow. And um, I just like to say personally that I really like kind of the rough quality of it. It almost, this piece specifically reminds me almost of a woodcut. That's a, that's a mm -hmm. kind of the, the engraved, the deep engraved quality right. of it and everything. Um, so, well, yeah. for me, this was all about the idea that there are. It's cool, where are you? And he's here, and he's there, but yet they're kind of in different worlds. Mm. You see, he's got that little design over his head in that world, and he's got a whole other thing. And they're searching for each other, but they're actually, they're just around the corner. They're just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we were on the way here tonight, we were just around the corner, ended up four miles away. <laughs> so they were just around the corner, but they can't connect with each other. That's wonderful. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. So, uh, what is your name and uh, what's the name of your piece? I'm Richard and this is an um, titled, um, and yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, looking at your work, um, I'm just going to ask you what, what kinds of things are you looking at? What inspired this piece? Um, so, actually, each of these different forms are from a, um, a, um, a um, separate model. Um, and they're all taken from gay kind of nightlife um, posters and ads. Um, so it's kind of taking all the different parts of these perfect forms um, and kind of cutting them up and then making a quote unquote more perfect form from them. Awesome. Um, so I see that it's in black and white uh, with some other uh, colors kind of overlaid. What was that choice to um, not use color? Well, I kind of wanted to be very like stark, and then to have like the red lines be almost further correcting lines, okay. so that even though almost like a plastic surgery exactly, correction, exactly like a plastic surgery correction. Also, it kind of gives the sense of veins or blood or arteries. It kind of gives it this other life as well. Very interesting, very interesting. Um, what other kind of mediums do you work in? Mostly um, like pen, pencil and some ink, um, but I'm mostly pencil, char, char, charcoal, chalk. I like to be able to blend. Yeah, blend. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so first of all, what's your name and what's the title of your work? Uh, my name is Mark Desavage and um, 
these are three self-portraits. Self-portrait as a nurse, self-portrait as a nun, and self-portrait as a schoolgirl. Um, so what we'd really like to know is um, what influences you? What kind of um, past artwork do you look at? Or what kind of artists um, influence you and inspire this kind of, this kind of work? Um, well, just as a visual style, I think I've been very influenced by the Flemish primitives, because I grew up in Bruges. So this idea of um, religious iconography is always throughout my work, even though it's not present you know, in sort of um, the visual technique, at least conceptually it's there. But in terms of the actual aesthetic, I've been very influenced by Japanese woodblock prints. Because I was, but at the same time, I was interested in how can I have this theme of the Flemish primitives and of religion meet the Japanese woodblock prints, and that's where this sort of comic book aesthetic came about. Because yes. what the Japanese aesthetic language and the Flemish aesthetic language mm. have in common is a great tradition of comic books, mm. you know things like Tintin Perfect. or whatever. Yeah. And that was sort of my bridge to connect the Flemish primitives and sort of the Belgian aesthetic with this Japanese sensibility. That's great. I know, just looking at your images, I definitely see um, a combination. I see definitely like some, something that could be like a hakusai, like a Japanese print yeah. with the work with the line. And exactly. you seem, you're very um, attentive to composition. Your compositions are very balanced. And throughout. they're very simple. Like, yes, yeah, very exactly. simple, stripped down, yeah. It's uh, it's quite the opposite from the Flemish, but then we still have uh, the oil portraiture. So just in the uses of oil painting. Okay, yeah. Just the uses of oil painting will automatically sort of connect it in that sort of same aesthetic history. And previously I actually always worked on canvas, with oil on canvas, which I found incredibly difficult to work with because it was incredibly inseparable from this great artistic history. Whereas the moment I work on paper, which has automatically a more, you know, Eastern sensibility to it, I was able to free myself from a lot of this uh, art historical baggage. That's really interesting to know. Um, so as far as the actual content, um, where does the content come from? Uh, well, for the content, I was really in uh, I was really interested in this idea of gender as both a psychological and a performative aspect. Because, um, you know, too often people see uh, gender as just a biological thing. But in the portraiture, I wanted to make it clear that it was a very introspective and psychological component. And then with the costumes, I kind of wanted to explain the performative side of it. That, um, that gender to a certain extent, is a game of role playing, of people playing dress up, you know, so dressing up as a nurse, a nun, a schoolgirl, there's that comical side to it where it's just a very superficial thing, mm -hmm. gender, but at the same time, in an introspective way, it's incredibly profound and psychological. That's really interesting. Um, as soon as I see the pieces, I get that sense. So that's very, that's, that's very great. And um, I'd also, I'd like to add that, to even further reinforce that, I see that the tension between the development of the actual um, portraits and, but you know, basically the actual um, physical flesh, yes. and then the contrast between that and the flatness of the clothes almost seems like they could be removed, like they're those kind of cardboard yes. cutouts that yes. can be placed and, and removed and, and, you know, to whatever fits your need or, or precisely, your purposes, yeah. just like gender, just like gender as a performance, That's, right? precisely, yeah. That's great. And uh, by that same token, it could also, beyond gender, mm -hmm. You could say that this oil part could represent the Flemish history of it. And then the flat parts come from the woodblock prints. So there's that extension of it as well. And you also have this, you have this push and pull where you do try to take him very seriously, but then sort of there, there's something quite comical about them. So it pulls you into this rather profound you know, area or domain, but then kind of brushes it off as something that's just superficial. That's great. Great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much.
All right, so first of all, uh, what's your name and what are the title of your two pieces? Okay. Hi, my name is okay, hold up. Okay. Elizabeth Jacobson, and the name of my piece is Shielded Madonna. Ooh, okay. And this is called Knock on Wood. Oh, great. So, um, what was the inspiration for these two pieces, and what kind of um, work do you look at? What, what artists, um, what previous styles do you look at? Well, the inspiration for this particular work mm -hmm. was, um, actually I was in Florence, Italy, Ooh. and I had very much wanted to do a piece there, and this being called Shielded Madonna is about a mother figure, mm -hmm. okay? And at the time that I did this, I was also working in cigar boxes, which that was housing the breasts here. And I've used that in several pieces, talking about inhalation, exhalation, kind of the idea when one smokes. I used to smoke and yeah, of smoke course. cigarettes out more. Um, so it was a kind of a metaphor for life, inhalation, exhalation, the breath. So I. I knew I was going to be working in a, uh, a studio where I could do work with plaster or materials and I just, like the weekend before I got to work, got into the studio, I just did some sketches and being in Florence there's a lot of figurative yes. sculptures of, of, you know, not only men, not only David, but there are a lot of women around yes. as well. So I just, in my, in my mind's eye, I just kind of cropped the breasts and said that's what I'm going to do, I'll have one in each, you know. Box. So that's, that's kind of how that came about. And then I didn't know the initially, I didn't know that I was going to leaf it, leaf it in silver leaf. So the, that just seemed appropriate because I was doing this figure in light of that it's, it's going to be a strong Madonna figure. And the Madonna not only represented like La Madonna, so to speak, but women, women in general, and women who were strong and doing things for the community. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how that came about. And just kind of like working with the autonomy, you know, mm -hmm. working with the woman figure. This I had found these are found objects. They are great. And I just, you know, knew they had to go somewhere. <laughs> you know. And I do like working with leaves. So this is uh, a variegated gold leaf that's applied to the panel here. And um, I think just it's pretty simple, but I, I like it very much. This, this. Yeah, I think the simplicity, um, you're keeping it very monochromatic, but it has this um, this real luster, the real metallic luster, that's great. And what you say about this piece, um, I can read that immediately, immediately. I mean, that comes up. It's it's almost reads as a, um, a kind of protective chest plate, you know, but of the woman who's always been left out historically as a warrior figure or as any kind of um, stronger, more dominant figure. Um, she's never had, you know, she's never had that kind of persona. Um, so that's that's really great. That's wonderful. And I think that so this is was originally plaster, and then you put the, yes, the leaf over it. Yeah. Additive. You know, it's like more or less pouring yeah. plaster into it, then shaping it, shaping it, shaping it. That's interesting. And and I like that you're using the cigar boxes. The cigar boxes, because um, I like your reading of it, the inhalation, exhalation, that's very interesting on one level. And then also for me, you also get the level of something that's so intimately related to masculinity. You know, the cigar box, the man's cigar and everything like that. But you're throwing that on its head. And you're saying, no, this can also be about inhalation, exhalation. It can also be about strong femininity. You know, so I like that. I definitely like that. And, um, so, so where exactly do you did you find these objects? Actually, I found those in a women's cafe, actually out in New Jersey. That was kind of they were discarded in the back of the cafe, oh. and it was like it's like oh wow, can I have oh, well, can I have those? Yeah. <laughs> I know. Those, are, those are mine. You just slip them into important. your purse or whatever you have. Um, you never really know when you're going to come across something that that speaks to you. You know, a lot of the work that I do, there are found objects. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I employ them quite often. Yeah. My background's in display and exhibit design, so okay. kind of putting situations together in space, putting materials together. So that's your specialty, really, is is, yeah, is looking you know, for things and, and finding yes, them and finding yes, their connection. Definitely. Okay. definitely. 
Okay, that's great. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Jonathan. Your eyes were closed one more time. Okay. One more time. Great. Awesome, Thank Casey. You. Do you want to see them? Do you want a hair tie? Well, no, you don't have to, but it's just supposed to like be that this is your hair. You don't have to if you don't want to, though. It's just a suggestion. And if you want, if you want to see yourself, ready? Pose. Beautiful. One more. Maybe like touch each other. <laughs> I didn't want to pull you away from your photo booth over there. Sure. And it's so like attractive. Everybody wants oh, to get over here thanks. and you know get their picture taken. Alright. Um, so first of all, what's your name and what is the name of your piece or your pieces that are in the show? My name is JD Rainbow. This work is called With My Hair Up to Heaven Brothers. Um, and it's part of the installation with my hair up to heaven. So this is this right here is documentation of an experience for basically sort of like an interaction between me and my brothers where I painted their faces and we did a photo shoot and then this is the interactive installation that viewers can come and participate in and get their photo taken. Wonderful yeah I like that element of it I like the the, the democratic part of it the actual yeah the interaction it really seems to be a place for the viewer in your work which is yeah, wonderful. I mean, people have so, fun with it. Yeah, they have fun with it. Um, was that your initial purpose, to really get the viewer to break down that kind of barrier between the viewer and the artist, or the viewer and the work? This actually was the idea first. Um, because when I was younger, I used to... The, the work is rooted in like my childhood. So I used to put long johns on my head and pretend like it was hair, and so this transformation would sort of happen, and I would have this long, golden, flowing hair. And my brothers are younger than I, and I used to do that to them as well, and they were just sort of like pawns in this game. Yes, yes. Um, so getting them to do this now was about that and their understanding of me, you know, sexuality, masculinity, and what that means to them. Um, and then I felt like I really wanted, I, I just finished graduate school, and it was, um, I was part of a, an interdisciplinary program that focuses on social practice, so I was really getting into like, social works and engaged work so I was like why not have people pose with the work like I did it's a lot about vanity and narcissism so people yeah. get into it and there's <laughs> mirrors and of course it's fun they can be they can be uh, simultaneously yeah. the voyeur and the exhibitionist yeah, you yeah. know but both um, so what kind of work do you look at when are you inspired by anything to make this or you feel like it's very unique to yourself I'm looking at Fragonard okay um, I'm the, looking the, the at Rococo. Yeah, yeah Rococo. Yeah. Um, I really was studying Ang, Jean Auguste Dominique Ang. Mm. Um, that is where the Turkish bath. Yes. That painting is referencing the Turkish bath. We're, we're, um, we were actually trying to figure out what exactly what you were referencing earlier. Yeah, so just that's taking these like historical mm -hmm. works and bringing them into a contemporary. Mm -hmm. And also setting. definitely turning them on their heads too, right? Yeah, subverting them. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, subversing is that the right word? Or Sub you could do subverting both. Subverting is the word. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you're the, the artist. Word. You could do either yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, what other mediums do you like to work in? Do you like specifically photography and installation? Um, you also do. I was a, so. I was mostly a painter. Okay. Um, I was really like, trained in painting. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is you kind of branching out a little bit. Yeah, because of the program that I was in, which was wonderful. There was a lot of theory. Um, there was not pressure, but, um, you know, they encouraged you to experiment. And so I got in. I did some performative videos. Um, I did photo where I would, like, pose in the photographs. I developed this drag persona, Cordelia Fagonard, who that is actually very nice. Cordelia Fagonard, she's in the <laughs> painting as well. So I did several photo shoots as her, um, and then yeah, I got into installation as well. So I just the program really helped me branch out and like broaden my practice. 
All right, that's wonderful. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you. Yeah. So first of all, um, what's your name and what's the name of your work, of your piece? Uh, my name is Joanne Block and currently I'm calling it Hoods. Um, so I guess the big question here is um, what inspired you um, to work this way um, with the certain type of material you're using, but also the, the content? Okay, good question. Um, the material, what inspired me, uh, was who inspired me, was Romare Bearden. Okay? Um, and this is one piece of a much larger project that has to do with transgender. Mm. And uh, a couple of years ago, I did a, a huge wall collage. And I was examining, uh, this is pre Caitlyn Jenner. <laughs> so we're going back to Chaz before, Bono. Before it's exploded into the media oh as God. something. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. something ridiculous, so, right? Chaz, as, as the spectacle now, right? I, yes. So Chaz Bono during that era, and I began the uh, piece. And then I started to, um, it was curious to me that I grew up uh, understanding a lot of many of the things that transgender people, uh, f uh, not felt, but were, I, I understood some of their uh, culture. Mm -hmm. However, uh, so, it, some of the struggles and, and, th and things that they were going the through. Struggles and the desire to look different mm -hmm. or be different mm -hmm. and, uh, and not fit in. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it, it was a very, uh, I didn't fully understand it, yep. okay? I didn't understand the feeling, so I started to explore myself and where I fit in. And uh, besides being a, a consideration of, uh, that it was circumstantial that I came, uh, came out during the Stonewall era, you know, so I came from a whole other culture. So uh, this is, I did a series of... Because um, of course this show is all about, um, you know, this, this new era that we're supposedly ushering into, right? With, with the legalization of gay marriage and everything like that. So just to put into context. Yeah. Okay. Because what you're talking about is perfect, you know. You're coming from a, an older generation and you're, you're yeah. now putting, you know, you're, you're now showing in this kind of um, uh, arena. Right. Where, but also where we were like much, I felt in the 60s, we were much more visible and in some ways colorful and that the transgender folks uh, are, are taking that over in their own way. And so anyway, back to what this piece is yeah. about. No, that's, that's, that's I, I, as far as I'm concerned, that's what it's all about. Because yeah. all of that's in there, right? That, I mean, because yeah. you're in there and all of that is in there, definitely. So it's about desire. Uh, and it's also, there's another piece that comes uh, right before this, which I call the curse. Um, the curse. <laughs> Very ominous. <laughs> which is the moment when I uh, started to menstruate. Mm. And I realized... Are they so we come back from our cliffhanger, yeah. and we're still talking with our artists. Um, so you were finishing up your thought? Yeah, I just wanted to say that there was a point in my life where I, I, I thought I was going to be a boy if I wanted to be one enough. Mm -hmm. And then there was a point when I realized that I wasn't. It was never going to happen. And that was the other piece I mentioned called The Curse. Yes, The Curse. And this piece follows The Curse. Mm. So the fantasy prevailed, mm. but... And I can see that's the trauma. You're rendering the traumatic moment, but it's also trying to move past that traumatic moment, right? And, right. and this, this definitely reads as something um, dealing with gender fluidity, gender performativity, yes. but also, of course, you're working with popular media, so we're also talking about popular conceptions of gender, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly, <laughs> exactly, so. yeah. So I could go on and on, but oh, yes. I, I, I can't. Let me just say I really like what you've done with the piece. I like, I, I'm a 
huge fan of photo montage and of collage work and of course of Romare Bearden too. Huh. So I know yeah, he's, he's a genius. The master, yes, okay. the master. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Right, we have a great show. We are all as God made us, and many of us much worse. And Yuko, who founded the Art Center here, will tell you that I'm a perfect example of the latter. And every human being contains an anima and an animus. I know that because I studied psychology. And if we deny that fact, then we become much less than what we should be as human beings. And uh, that's all I'll say on that matter. However, uh, the art center here was founded by a great lady, uh, Yugo Ni, and many of you know who she is already. But back in uh, 1996, when she acquired this building, the neighborhood was full of uh, gangsters, drug dealing, burnt out cars. The buildings were abandoned because you couldn't live here. No decent people would live here. And you couldn't walk the streets. You walk out the door, you find a dead body. Well, Hugo acquired a property in the 1980s here in Williamsburg. And uh, she uh, fixed it up with her own hands, actually, and uh, worked with the local community, uh, a lot of Hispanics and people like that, police, and helps helped to start cleaning up. And one day, in 1996, she drove by this building here. Beautiful little building, and a big sign up there, for sale. Well, you have a contact with the owner, and uh, the owner said, well, uh, who are you? She said, I'm an artist. And the owner said, well, no, don't bother asking about buying this building because you can't afford it. We've had so many artists come wanting to you know, acquire the building. Well, she persisted, and uh, to their surprise, she made an offer. <laughs> and indeed, uh, there was a closing on the building. And after she acquired it, she only had $50 left in the bank. Well, that's a big risk, but she's a risk taker. And uh, she believed in herself, she believed in the building, she believed in Williamsburg, and I believe in her too. I believed in her too, back 20 years ago. And as you see, uh, we, we now have a wonderful neighborhood because she worked with the community to help build it and attracted a lot of artists and now real estate developers. In fact, she was named uh, Woman of the Year by uh, Howard Golden back in the, uh, I think 1998 thereabouts, for having transformed all the northern part of Brooklyn by her activities. And subsequently, Governor George Pataki named her one of the state's women of the year, along with Diane Sawyer. You know she's a great newscaster. There, I think there were three or four other women. And uh, said that, you know, congratulating her on transforming the Williamsburg Savings Bank and, you know, helping this historic renovation and, and helping the historic uh, community here. And that's not the only honor she got. Subsequently, Marty Markowitz gave her a Woman of the Year Award. And uh, she was named an Asian Woman of the Year, you know, for, for Brooklyn. And more recently, a couple of years ago, Pratt Institute, one of the greatest art schools in the world that she attended, uh, uh, named her an outstanding citizen, along with Tracy Boyle, who did that also in the city council. She, she received many awards for having done this work. So you can stand here today in this wonderful building, which still needs a lot of work. But this lady has done so much for the city uh, not only of Brooklyn, but the International Community of the Arts as well. And I'd like to introduce her right now. Yuko, are you here? You are. Congratulations. <laughs> and here is the great and wonderful lady herself. Thank you very much. And Terence Rindor is the president and executive of the War Center. War Center, Williamsburg Art and Historical Center, is a, a mission, I would say, to bridge between you and me, men and women, young and old, as well as 
local, national, international artists with all disciplines. This happened to be a fine art show on the second floor, but third floor will be a performing center. So we also bridge performing center and fine art shows. First floor you came through, and that is a reception hall. Happened to be very old, ornate, and this is the landmark building and national treasure. So we we have all the classical, traditional art and the first floor. So many creative things happen at the last center, and I like to welcome all of you tonight. Thank you very much for coming over in a heavy rain and. Wonderful show, as you can see. We bridge, bridge between, as I said, men and women. This happened to be a special exhibition, LGBTQ. And wonderful artists, thank you very much for participating. And I'd like to introduce the great curator, and he is my assistant, Richard Sanchez. And Richard, as you might know, he is such a reserved, quiet person. He will never say, I am going to curate this particular show. I have to tell him, could you please curate this special exhibition? Because those special group of people are very gifted, very talented, and I know quite a few of them way back from 1970s, 60s, 70s as well. So thank you very much. Yeah, wonderful. This is my body, I would say. <laughs> and, okay. And Richard, Richard, yeah. okay. Would you like to say something? Where is Elizabeth? The oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Elizabeth is his sister, lovely sister here. Okay. Thank you all for, for um, coming. Um, we first started to uh, talk um, a, um, of um, so doing this show last June, um, and we kind of wanted to create a space that was really open to all different forms of art, different people, um, and, and um, wa means um, peace or or unity or um, or uh, or um, like harmony. So we kind of created a queer peace, queer unity, um, and I think all of the um, the the um, the um, artists for 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 their work. And um, of of course for I'm calling Yuko for um uh, for um, for um, letting me create this show. Thank you. As Richard said, wa in Japanese is peace, harmony, and unity. So through the international language of art. We come to understand each other, we come to love each other, we respect each other. That is the War Center's mission. So those of you who have been here before, uh, you know we have produced quite a few interesting shows and you can please bring more people here. We need your support and that's what I wanted to mention. And those who are here, participating artists, we are going to have a photo taking. You know how Japanese, they love to take photos. <laughs> it, it is a memory. And so please come forward before you disappeared.
Do you want to do again? Yes, in your face. One, two, three. maybe like a little, maybe make some angles with your arms. And try to sort of maybe get trapped in the ball. 